Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Lucas Myers. Lucas is a program associate with the Wilson Center's Asia program, where he administers the Wilson China Fellowship. Before joining the Asia program team, Lucas worked on democracy and human rights issues and as an analyst on terrorism and extremism. And Lucas, all of that background will factor into what we're going to talk about today, which is the situation in Myanmar post-coup. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, there's definitely a lot going on and I've been working on Myanmar for quite a few years now. So it's something that uh, sadly the last few months has been uh, pretty active. I know you've been following this story for a long time, uh, even before the coup, uh, this country, I should say. And so I am wondering, many of, of us were surprised when this happened. Should we have been surprised or was this something that we could see coming? I think it was, it's surprising, but not shocking. Mm. Um, this, so Myanmar had been under, undergoing a democratic transition since 2011, but it was very halting and, and somewhat uh, weak. And as we have seen, the military was able to, to leave the barracks and, and overthrow the government essentially um, on a whim. You know, after the November 2020 election in Myanmar, you know, coincidentally happening the same month as ours, um, the military had begun expressing concern that the election was, was fraudulent or invalid, which there's no evidence that this was the case. Uh, a vast majority of Myanmar's people came out to support uh, the NLD, the overthrown government. And the military really in this situation, I think just decided that democratic transition was no longer in its interests. Um, and so it, uh, senior General Min Aung Long, uh, the leader of the coup, decided to uh, overthrow the government. And there had been some indications and, and, and signals over the months preceding the February 1st coup. But I will admit it, is, it was quite surprising. I didn't think personally that, that, it was gonna, that they were going to take that step. I thought that they were going to challenge the, the results in the courts and, and make some noise about it. But I didn't uh, foresee them making this sort of a step. And the early returns would suggest that the, there will be no backing down. They seem determined to follow through on this. Yeah, it's the level of violence is quite, uh, you know, it, it's demonstrating how how much resolve that they really have to continue this um, crackdown. I mean, they've killed at least 500 people as of today and, and arrested something like 2,700. Um, and then and it's only continued to escalate. Recently, they deployed a few uh, light infantry divisions that, that were known and, and under sanction uh, by international actors as the United States for their role in the Rohingya uh, human rights violations and violence against minority groups in outlying regions. So these, uh, these uh, infantry units are very much um, in a shoot to kill uh, mentality. I mean, this is very much a, a, an extraordinary level of violence. Did the handling of the Rohingya crisis and, and everything that transpired in the country prior to this, was that a precursor to where we are today? I think Myanmar has had a very complex political history. Um, for instance, they've since independence in 1948, there's been ongoing uh, insurgencies throughout the country at various times. Some have you know, been under ceasefire and others have been in combat. You know, most recently over the last few years, the Iraqan army and the Rakhine and uh, the Kachin Independence Army have been you know, waging some conflict against the military. And, and so these, this, this has been a relatively unstable uh, country for quite a long time. And, the, and as we have seen, the democratic transition wasn't um, very strong. And in fact, the military itself, you know, under the 2008 constitution, already had maintained 25% of parliamentary seats for itself. So really, it, it, this was not a, um, you know, this, this democratic transition was very nascent. And I think at, at any time, it was going to be uh, at risk of something like this happening. And I think Aung San Suu Kyi knew that. And, and she, you know, had very publicly defended the military's conduct uh, in the Rakhine in, in, its, in the human rights violations against the Rohingya people. Um, and I think there's, there were some indications that she was attempting to maintain positive ties to the military to avoid some sort of overthrow. And really, from what I've seen, the military saw her continued popularity. They, they won, the, her party, the NLD, won something like 82% of the, mm -hmm. of the, the vote in, in, um, in the country at the last election. And they decided that this democracy wasn't working for them anymore. Her arc has been incredible to watch. It's, it's rare that we've seen a world leader with so many highs and lows over a period from hero to villain, now to a, a hero again in, in some ways. 
talk about her leadership because you just made a really interesting point. You were saying that one of the things that she was criticized for internationally supporting the military in its treatment of the Rohingya, that that may have been a strategic move more than any pronouncement of what she really believed. To be sure though, at the same time, I, I do think that there are some indications that, you know, she's a complex figure. And I think she, for a long time, her record had shown that she had taken stances such as never referring to the Rohingya as Rohingya people, uh, referring them as Bengalis uh, is, is a common term you see. So this was not, something that I think she's necessarily ideologically opposed to. I think a lot of people in Myanmar, unfortunately, have quite negative views of, of Muslim minorities and the Rohingya in particular. Um, but I do think that in general, her conduct throughout her tenure as state councilor was to sort of placate the military and at least keep a positive working relationship. Although some, on occasion, she did push back. I mean, they, they, a couple of years ago, they had launched a quite prominent constitutional reform effort uh, which was guaranteed to fail uh, because of the military's 25% seats. But I think some of those actions had uh, concern some in the military, particularly, you know, men on the law. Do we have a good sense of the, the timing of why now or, or when it happened a couple of weeks ago? Was there any, you know, we know about the, the phony charges that you've dismissed as not having any legitimacy, both about the election and about potential crimes committed by Aung San Suu Kyi and other leaders. But so why at this moment, was there anything that prompted it becoming urgent in the, in the, from, the, from the perspective of the military at this time? I think in general, they, one, you know, it happened the day before the new government was meant to take office, you know, so that obviously is key. But in general, I, I think it, they probably decided it, you know, sometime after the results came in in November 2020, where they had just lost completely. I mean, their proxy political party, the USDP, only, you know, had lost half of its seats. And even as the second largest party in parliament, it only had, you know, a little more than, a, you know, something like 20 seats. I mean, it was very minimal presence after this election. And so from my point of view, the military had made their decision and wanted to take advantage perhaps of, you know, the international community being distracted by COVID and, and you know, the kind of everyone kind of looking away. And I do think that on some level it was timed uh, decently well, although waiting till the Biden administration came into office probably wasn't the greatest of timing either. Uh, you know, for them, I think if they had launched it a few months prior, they would have had even less pushback from the United States than, they, uh, the, than they've received thus far. Speaking of that pushback, let's talk about the international community and, and its response. As we sit here recording our discussion today, a, a UN envoy is warning of a bloodbath unless the international community gets involved in a more, in a, a more direct manner. What, what about the response so far and, and what can be done? What influence can external actors have? In general, you know, the international response has been relatively weak, in my view, certain countries in, in in the West, you know, the United States, the United Kingdom, the EU, New Zealand have, have issued sanctions, uh, targeted sanctions, most notably, although the US this week uh, announced that it will be suspending bilateral trade relations with uh, Myanmar until democracy is restored. So that's a pretty significant step. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't, they don't have a lot of leverage. I mean, the US doesn't have uh, extensive trade relations with Myanmar in the first place. And, and in general, this, uh, political, you know, this coup comes out of the political context of Myanmar itself. You know, a lot of people, and my, myself included, talk about the U.S.-China angle, you know, the importance regionally, and all that is very key to understanding the global context here and, and why this really does matter. But at the end of the day, I think the military was influenced by its own calculus. They probably predicted that they would be placed under some sanctions from certain Western countries, but they, they also likely made the, the calculation that they could weather this storm. They were isolated for many years, you know, prior to the transition in 2011. And they didn't have, unlike in, you know, officials in say Russia or China, they, they, a lot of these generals didn't have extensive ties to the West that targeted sanctions would put in jeopardy anyway. And so they're quite uh, removed from this. And they haven't really lost a ton of their international backing anyway. You know, China and Russia continue to, you know, they express concern, but they haven't pulled out of their relationship with, with Myanmar. And so at the end of the day, I think the military understood that this sort of response was coming, but they could probably weather it. If they chose to exercise it, is there a country that has any leverage that could make a difference? I think of all the countries that 
you know, you look at the the region. I think China has the most influence, you know, quote unquote, in, in the region. However, again, I mean, I don't think China is very happy about this at all. I think they had a much stronger relationship with the NLD uh, than they do with the military because, you know, it's a very complicated relationship. But China has, you know, long, you know, invested in, in Myanmar. The China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, uh, CMAC as it's called, is part of the Belt and Road, and China views that very strategically. They've supported and armed various uh, ethnic armed uh, organizations along Myanmar's border with China. It's a relatively porous border. There's a lot of drug trafficking, uh, you know, over that border. And, and in general, I think the relationship with the military in China is quite uh, tense at times. But I think China is very pragmatic and it consistently its foreign policy has demonstrated uh, a desire to protect its own interests and, and sort of avoid moral concerns. And so in this case, China appears to have decided that the military is likely to remain on top and it doesn't want to jeopardize its investments, which you know are in 2020 were $21 billion. It doesn't want to jeopardize the strategic importance of, of CMEC. And it also doesn't really want to destabilize a country on its border. I mean, there's been refugee crises in the past and, and refugees have, have moved into Yunnan province in China and they don't wanna see Myanmar devolve into civil war. And so really at the end of the day, I think um, they wanna maintain a, a sort of you know, step back, keep UN sanctions from happening and, and ensuring that the situation calms down. Does that mean they're Basically? happy? No, but it means that they're you know, pragmatic and, and gonna be approaching the situation, um, sort of see what happens. What, what does calming down look like, Lucas? And, and are we talking about an iron fist, total control by the military, and not civil war, and how quickly can that happen? Is that the assumption that you, you describe that as the assumption China's operating on? Is that the assumption that you as an analyst are working on that there is a return to civilian rule is not in the cards in any near term? I, I'm on, based on my analysis, I don't see a civilian uh, control returning in the near future on, under really very many scenarios at all. Uh, but actually I'm, I'm increasingly concerned that a civil war is possible. I think the last week and a half or so, we have seen um, one, the government in exile organized by some NLD politicians has been openly courting some of the ethnic armed organizations, uh, two of which the Karen National Union um, and the Kachin Independence Army have started to engage uh, in combat again with the Tatmadaw, the military. And we've seen some, some violence spreading. A lot of NLD uh, dissidents have, have fled into the Karen areas to, to seek refuge there. and, and I think there is some real concern that, that there could be more and more of an escalation in the violence. Um, it's, you know, obviously every country has its own situation, but I do see some parallels to the situation in Syria in 2011 and 2012, where there was these ongoing peaceful protests and the government cracked out with increasing violence and then the protesters responded with some violence and then it escalated into a civil war. Um, and that is, I don't think a, 100% likely possibility, but it is probable and very possible at this time. And that's something that China, I think, would maybe reconsider as calculus if it looked like it was heading that direction. And and we've seen now a crackdown on journalists. I think the latest uh, I saw before logging on with you today is more than 50 have been arrested. You mentioned the increase in civilian deaths. Uh, it, it's a pretty dark scenario given that. What is the, the posture for the United States? You, you mentioned that perhaps it would have been to the advantage of the military to stage this coup prior to the election of Joe Biden. Well, what can Joe Biden do? What can the U.S. administration do? I think really, you know, at this point, the U.S. has, has rolled out most of the options that it currently has that are feasible. You know, and those are pretty extensive sanctions uh, against various, for instance, military holding companies that have um, a very widespread uh, involvement throughout Myanmar's economy. I mean, everything from real estate to hotels to grocery stores. I mean, the, the military is quite entrenched uh, in the economy and we've sanctioned those holding companies, which makes it harder for, for international uh, businesses to do business with them. Um, you know, additionally, the US has been pressuring, uh, you know, publicly and behind the scenes of our allies and partners to, to join us in condemning the coup more openly and joining in the sanctions. And I think at this point, continuing to garner an international uh, movement on this issue is key. Although I will say that it's uh, some of our allies have, have refrained from, from issuing sanctions 
And I don't see it as particularly likely that countries such as Japan or India will join the United States um, in sanctioning Myanmar just because they have you know, extensive ties to the country, a uh, stronger economic relationship, and, and they don't want to see uh, Myanmar destabilize or grow closer to China, for instance. Is military intervention even on the table? And if so, uh, who would be behind that intervention? I don't see that as on the table uh, at, at, uh, at this time at all. I mean, I, I don't think that the U.S. has vital interests that would warrant such a thing. And, and as we've seen before, military in intervention often just complicates uh, really complicated right. situations. Um, so really, I think the U.S. has exhausted its playbook uh, beyond just continuing to ensure that the sanctions regi regime is strong and working with um, international allies to try and coordinate on this issue. So what does the country's future look like? What is the prospectus for Myanmar given all of these, these trend lines? Unfortunately, I think it's quite grim. You know, I mentioned that there's a possibility of a civil war, which even the, U the United Nations Special Envoy had warned of uh, yesterday that this is a very real possibility. You know, that would be probably a worst case uh, outcome. Um, but in general, I think what the military is looking for is, or at least what they had hoped initially before the protest movement had really kicked off was that they could create a managed democracy, you know, where they would amend the constitution to make their control even more legally firm. Um, you know, for instance, they, had, they announced a couple of weeks ago uh, this proposal to adopt proportional representation for the uh, electoral system. And, you know, they had, a, Myanmar has had a first past the post system, which is what's resulted in the NLD gathering, you know, such a large majority in, in the parliament. Um, under a proportional system, this would be to the military's favor because their proxy political party or any other political party that they, that they choose to support, you know, if it was the second largest, it would win a much higher number of seats than it did, say, in November 2020, because then it would be allocated the second most seats, even if they only won, say, you know, 20% of the vote. And, and so that's a one key that, that looks, I think that military was trying to develop a, a sort of managed democracy. And this, and I see parallels to the situation in Thailand after their coup in 2014. Obviously, the main difference being they didn't see this type of widespread violence that we're seeing today in Myanmar. But in general, the military there was amended the constitution, oversaw a unfair and unfree election where the current prime minister is the, the general who, who launched the coup in, in the first place. And I think Myanmar would wants to ideally pursue that kind of option. I mean, even uh, recently, they hired a PR specialist to rehabilitate their image in the West. I mean, this is pointing to, you know, a longer term strategy of them hoping to have, you know, created a managed democracy. Now, with this situation as it's unfolded and the level of violence, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think this is um, sort of moved out of their control. You know, I, I have an impulse, I must confess, to sometimes uh, go fishing for a silver lining, but there doesn't seem to be one available in this scenario. Not really. Although the one thing I will say that I've been following in recent days uh, is, so this committee representing, uh, uh, this, this new committee representing the exiled NLD politicians has recently scrapped, they've announced that they're going to scrap the 2008 constitution. They've out, they've launched outreach to these ethnic armed organizations, and they've really tried to organize uh, a government in exile. And I think, you know, if you want a silver lining, at least this movement is really strong. The, the majority of the people of Myanmar genuinely oppose the military, and they've braved truly extraordinary levels of oppression in the last two months that uh, I think it just demonstrates the depth of their feeling that this is, they need to protect their, their nascent democratic transition. And so there is hope that they, that at the end of the day, I mean, they're going to continue fighting for what they, their rights uh, in Myanmar. And I hope that, you know, they're successful. Although I do think that at this time, the military really is extraordinarily aggressive in its crackdown, and there's just not a lot of hope. Well, Lucas, thank you very much for helping us sort through this very complex issue. And uh, we know you'll stay on it. And so we'll look forward to speaking with you about it again. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. That's Lucas Myers from the Wilson Center's Asia program. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.